so it's expanded significantly. We'd, we'd, we'd feel very, very happy to put our first 11 against any of these first 11 from any committee in Europe uh, and probably the US as well. So we've been very lucky and we try to offer a good personalised service for all the patients that come to us and try and make it as efficient as quick as possible. That's what we do. And we just do shoulders, knees and toes, etc. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's That's basically cool. Mainly, there are a couple of other things on site. We don't do everything, we just concentrate on those areas. Anyway, me. Um, so, hi, good evening. Uh, I'm just going to talk about the knee joint because that's all I do. I need to know anything from there to about there. Nothing below. And my fractures are all below my area. Actually, turn your skin. I will. Yeah. Um, so, so this is me. I was <coughs> stumped for 20 years at Guys and Tortoises. Um, I can occasionally ski without injuring myself, which is all right. Um, and my so part of been mainly things like soft tissue ligament reconstruction, like ACL reconstructions. And I've had a number of injuries over the years. So skiing is a is a high risk game. Um, I don't come anywhere near Warren's list actually. He beats me about hands down a number of injuries. But you can go from MCL, a few broken ribs, being knocked out, impact fractures, people in a foot crush injury. And now I need to add a new one from last Friday, um, which says that powder skiing injuries sometimes if your ski catches a branch, it can be unusual. So, I want to talk about how to be safe, really. And it's not just the knees, this is everything. And the first one I would always say is be fit. Our biggest issue is seeing people who come to our, our clinics after they've been injured, and they look, they look unfit before they walk through the door, and you can see why they've got injured. Skiing is actually a fairly intense, fairly active sport. If you're not fit enough to do it, at least modify what you do and don't overdo it. Next one will come as a dismay to some people. I say, you don't drink and drive, you don't drink and ski. Yeah. Pretty simple, because if you're doing 30 miles an hour, you wouldn't do it on the M25 in London, you shouldn't do it on the M25 here. It, it, I'll, I'll show you some data as well. Uh, if anybody ever says to me, it's time for one last run before you go, to, you go home, I've gone. Never go out for that last run, it seems like it's fated to me. Uh, if you want to ski, Learn, get taught <coughs> that way. You wouldn't go and do anything without learning about it, and, and you can improve your experience and have a far better time. So, tuition is really important. If you're over from the UK, remember it's 112 um, and have that number available, and you need to know the local number from your phone. Next thing, don't overestimate your ability. Um, a lot of British skiers go into ski shops and say, oh, Yeah, I'm pretty good, and they they will immediately give you a kit that is inappropriate for you. They'll cramp your bindings up, they'll make them really tight, and you're much more likely to become injured. If you want to ski off piste, please, please get a guide and go and do it properly and look after yourself. Um, please wear a helmet. The data's all there for helmets now as to why you should. The Arberg data is fantastic. And even the Americans and their start to wear helmets, it seems, globally. And if you're going to go off piste, you have to take the safety kit. So airbag, for me, is, I think, actually added to the list, but shovel, probe, and transceiver, absolutely. And if you don't know how to use a transceiver and do a search, you shouldn't be there. Simple as that. Okay, that's the next trailer. That little picture is um, just the Jean <coughs> a few years ago. And we were skiing with, this guy here was obviously very well, he's a banker, he offered to go to the W Hotel and buy us all drinks. We thought this is great. And, and we're skiing down, and somebody was skiing on beside us, and suddenly it was like a gunshot going off. Bang, 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 and he hit a ridge. And what he'd done is he'd shattered his femur in about four places. Oh. And he, and he, he and we looked at each other and thought, so we stopped to go and see him. And he had no pain at all initially, absolutely fine, just had an extra knee joint. And <laughs> while we were seeing him, somebody else hit the same rut and then flew over us literally over us, if they'd hit us, they'd have killed, they'd have killed us, and landed and was unconscious in the snow with head injury and was bleeding. When we got to him, he was also pitched. <laughs> so um, it was an interesting scenario, so we put the most useless person in the front, the banker, and I had friends with a pharmacist who at least talked to the guy with the leg injury because he knew what was happening there, and then I was trying to cajole the other guy to not try and ski down, and then he got up because he's bleeding from his head and he was very good. And eventually we got made and rescue him, we got a helicopter for one, and the other one went with a blood wagon to ski down uh, to the show. 
but it was very interesting to have these things and it, the weather was changing it was minus 20 that day the snow started to blow the winds got up the heli couldn't land anywhere near the injury was so we had to dig a trough in the slope to actually put him in the, the, the wagon and get him fed so you need to know a little bit about who do you call what do you do and look after people um, that's my little quickie about drinking so how coal concentration 43 percent of 200 injuries Okay, so nearly half are drunk. Mm. Enough said. <coughs> Where's the most dangerous place <coughs> in the ski resort? Chairlift. Mm -hmm. Most of you all know this already. I always sit on the edge of the chairlift. The moment it lands, I'm gone. And the reason we don't like it is it's low velocity. You get people get tangled up. As <coughs> you're rotated around, you're guaranteed to twist coming. <laughs> so you're driven around by the chair, the bindings unlocked, stay locked because you're low velocity and ping ping ping, your new ligaments go and it's very good fun, isn't it? Thank you very much. <laughs> but be careful on chariots. Next thing, tobogganing, big thing here for a certain restaurant up the mountain. I there would be toboggans down, especially at night. Not anymore. Banned now. Is it banned? Yeah. Hallelujah. Mm -hmm. So tobogganing is, has provided the worst injuries <coughs> I've ever seen on ski slopes. Because people go down again, often they may be on the roll, but they use their leg as a brake and then they post in the snow and suddenly the foot that was in front of them is now back here. <coughs> and they tend to injure everything, including the nerves and the arteries. So it's not just bones and tips of tissue. And they can be catastrophic life changing injuries, so I'm delighted we've stopped that. Um, how often do people get injured? Well, basically it's one per, one injury per 10,000 lift runs, and the average skier only does 10 runs a day. I never realized that. Yeah. So it's about you know, one every 10 seconds. So we find this has been consistently shown across the whole world as well, the data is the same. What are we noticing from this thing? Well, people are getting heavier, which is a problem. Are people are going faster. That snowfall actually reduces the high energy injuries because if it's powder, people don't go as quickly. If it's icy and hard, people are going very quickly. We know that the kit is so much better that people now can actually turn the skis that they couldn't do all those years ago with those two, two meter 30 skis that were thin. <coughs> you had to actually really know what you're doing to be able to turn them. Now with the parabolic cut, you can cut a corner very easily. So it's very interesting to see the change in the dynamic of people skiing, and the change in their health, and the change in their weight. So they're all heavier, everybody's heavier. It also depends what you want to do. So that's my idea of a good day, but other people like different things. They want to pot around with some blue runs and red runs, have a lovely lunch in a restaurant, have a really lovely time out which is fantastic. Um, snowboarders, and skiers, there's a long history of uh, unhappiness. So collisions with skiers and was 8% of injuries. And of those that get injured, most people are skiers, so 80% of injuries are from skiers. And again, it comes back to this, basically one per thousand skier days. And it repetitively comes back to the same thing. So why does it happen to the knee? It's because you rotate, you've got a six foot plank attached to your, your foot, there's a huge rotational force, and then the binding should release. And they have a release point, and you have to be at the right, right point, right velocity, and the right force at that moment. It's different in the touring bindings, they don't release the same way. Um, female injury is more common for a lot of reasons, anatomy, physiology, hormonal influences and ligamental strength, they're all a bit different. Ski boots are all different. <coughs> and obviously the old days, they had those lace-up leather boots and they all fractured just below above the ankle. They had the horrendous injuries from that time. Now we've nicely taken that solid ski boot that goes up here and has transferred the, the, most of the force up to the knee. And it's very rare to have an injury inside a ski boot. Um, and technology's changed, obviously, I've just said, all these people are getting heavier and uh, that they're unfit. There was a binding called the knee binding that was released for a while, and they actually guaranteed your money back if you did tear ACL hits off the market. 
So the biggest thing I would talk about is pre-sleep, pre-injury. So you also get people who try suddenly three weeks before they're due to come here for a week holiday, they go mad. They've done no exercise whatsoever and they go absolutely bonkers and they injure themselves. So that's where a lot of our physio clinics come in very helpful. They can assess people, give them advice, and they need time, they need a balanced program. Um, things like Leg Blast, the clinic to support guys have got programs online you can subscribe to. And for those of you who are really masochistic, watch the Didier Kush video for fitness. External race is the most crazy thing I've ever seen. And then we have to cope with people as we age, well, <coughs> as we used to be. And what can we do to get older people through these trips? We can, we can, cheat, we can inject them. I think one injection a year is not a big deal, and I would have no problem doing that. Uh, bracing, soft bracing or functional bracing. I'm not the biggest fan of bracing, but it can be helpful. Biggest thing again is making sure they're in good condition. And, and they choose what they ski. They don't necessarily need to ski Montfort's moguls every day ten times. They could go and cruise down or something else. Um, on the other hand, that's a nice day. Yeah. Helicopter guide, good fun, and everything else. Um, we know that overall knee supports don't seem to change how the knee works. It doesn't have a massive effect on proprioception, and I usually tell them it just keeps their knee warm. But a lot of people psychologically feel so much better by wearing the sleeve, so if it works for them, it's fine. If you mix snowboard and skiers together, that's your increased injury rate. So, best to avoid them. So, what injuries do we sustain? So, traumatic ligaments, menisci, the cartilages in the knee, fractures, and combinations of the above. Classic thing we see a lot of fracture here, it's the typical plateau. <coughs> where that bit of bone just hit that bit and crunched it down and we can fix that by lifting it up with some plates and screws but it always nearly always involves metal work and holding it together and it's bad news because people that could be a slightly more interesting one um, look, that's lots in the industrial grade titanium it's expensive it's a long healing process and people have a permanent risk of osteoarthritis after a fracture involves a joint so there is a consequence but you can get people back. It takes them 12 to 18 months to get their full recovery from an injury like that. Um, and again, this comes down to what we talk about people going fast, they weigh more, and partly reckless behaviour as well. And just talking, so in summary, they need the surgery, often need bracing for about two months. They start off only using part of the weight, then they have to work hard with physiotherapy, and they rehab for a whole year, and it's slow and they get frustrated and it's difficult, and they have to work at it. If they do, they can still get a good result. Um, ligaments the knee, my favourite bit. So the cruciate ligament is the one that's injured nearly the most. What does it do? It gives you stability, so your knee actually can twist safely a little bit, and it stops it going from front to back. And if you lose that, that's when people's knees give way, or they collapse. They <coughs> It also tells you, without you looking, where your knee is in space and time. So that's called proprioception. And this is what happens when you haven't got an ACL. Okay. Yeah. So if you just watch this bit here, yeah. and that's the knee popping because the knee is actually out of joint and I'm popping it back into joint, it's still luxury and it pops in. And that's because people don't, they don't have an ACL. And that's the front to back bit. So again, you've got this extra play you shouldn't have in the knee. And that's what we see inside, the ligaments ripped off the side, there's blood and nothing very much, but and that's what we're going to reconstruct. Uh, interestingly, in recreational skiers, far more women than men get injured. But in the professionals, it's equal. I've never quite been able to follow that, but there's lots of data to support that. There's a big vogue recently that those of you working in skills of, of repairing the ACL, sewing it back down. And the results for that are, um, let's just say, not very good. So it's been a fashionable vogue. There's a very small number of people for whom it probably is an option. Most people it isn't, and it's being pushed very heavily. There are lots of adverts in ski magazines, and they're probably inappropriate. Um, what happens if you tear your ACL? Well, 
my top line for anybody who gets injured abroad is never have surgery altitude. <coughs> There's no need. There's absolutely no need for an ACL to have surgery immediately. Unless you are Lionel Messi and you want to play in six months precisely and you're being paid a million pounds a week to play. For the rest of the world, there's no need, and it, all it does is add to your risk, because you're having surgery usually in a country where you don't understand what's happening, you'll never see your surgeon again, you're treating people, and then you have to travel after surgery, it's going to be a risk of blood clots and all sorts of complications. And the place that seems to do this the most <coughs> is Austria. In Switzerland, they give you a brace, they give you crutches, and stay there, there, now off you go. In France, almost always the same for ligament injuries. Um, Obviously, if you have a fracture and your bone sticking to the skin, you're going to need surgery wherever you are. But soft tissue type injuries around the knee, go home and avoid those risks. Um, I put America in for entertainment sake because um, some of our patients go over there and they have surgery and they look at their bill and their bill is spectacular. And the first thing they do at one particular clinical bill is they find out your, your actual limit of your insurance. And your initial bill will be $500 less than your ultimate limit. And then they follow that up when you got back to the UK about six weeks later with another bill arrives for another seven or eight thousand dollars. I've tried to go in a job there for many years. And <laughs> <laughs> um, so <coughs> the other leg ligament that's commonly injured is the medial ligament. So that's on the inside of the knee down, and that stops your leg going outwards like that. <coughs> so it's really common, it's the snowplow injury where people collapse inwards and the skin is going in like that. Um, and we see it lots, obviously, in football as well, block tackles, things like that. And people describe this tearing sensation of pain and loss of motion. And we just see as it rips. The problem is as it rips, the bit more rips, then rip your ACL in the middle. So you go MCL first, then ACL, and you can keep on going, actually, you it fully. And they, most people will just have pain and no instability. That's great. One injury will get better, usually in about six weeks. In fact, my wife is recovering from one of those deaths right now. Um, <coughs> medial pain instability, when it wobbles, so you take the leg and move it, I'll show you a picture of that in a minute, that takes longer and we're going to brace those people and look after them. Grade three, the whole thing just opens and flops around and is really unstable. If you see that, actually they're injured more than one ligament, so we know. So, you can see it wobbling open, so it's doing that. <coughs> But it's actually painless, so you can actually do that to somebody. The, the one where I did where I pivoted the knee, I'll only let you do that once while they're awake. I'll never let you do it again, so you, you can only see it under anesthesia. And these people often describe a lot of these. So when you tear your MCL, you can't describe it. You can't <coughs> And we see this, this is an MRI showing what's ripped over the side over here. And we also worry about people tearing their cartilages, this thing here. And that's actually the end of the injury behind it, which is sort of red and, and tall. And they're braced, and they do really well with bracing. Most people will actually heal. And most, for a pro football, we expect them back playing at 12 weeks after grade 2 MCL injury. For amateurs, obviously longer. I would expect for most people to say six to eight weeks for a grade one, three months for a two, and if it's a grade three, they're going to need lots of surgery. Rehab's going to be six to twelve months. I'll, I'll leave that bit. That's just about. There are lots of ways we can do this. Um, it doesn't really make too much difference. Um, just a note about technique and skiers. So obviously, uh, this one of my favourite patients. He skis the British Army. Uh, you can see his techniques absolutely superb. ACL, MCL. ACL times two, uh, I think he does right shoulder, I think break through it. So he, he loves it, he goes out with the army, on doing it. So uh, um, it's always good to see that the Brits will take, keep, keep on going. <laughs> then there's the other side of the knee, this outside bit, and that bit is more complicated. There are lots of structures coming around here, and lots of those injuries are kind of ignored and forgotten and missed actually. Typically, even in professional centres, they miss them. And for those, we often try and make a surgery with bracing. That's what happens with this one. So now we're going the other way. The knee's wobbling open the other side. And if you put people and move their feet around, you can see a difference 
and have got to move and rotate. And that's why I have one really cool reef slide. So that, that's what happens when you rip that side of the knee apart and you've, that's the bone, that's the little bone, the fibula, that's the big bone, the tibia. There's a nerve here and often that gets wedged in the <coughs> fracture there. And when that does that, you can lose the ability to lift your foot up. You what's called a foot prop. So it's a pretty bad injury and um, any fracture in that area should be looked at really carefully to avoid that risk of the nerve being damaged. And we rebuild it. There are lots of different ways. That's one way. This is like a triangular construct, which works really well, and that's probably the most popular at the moment. And it works really well. And we've got, I mean, I've got people who've gone back to track on with faster times post ACL push up than they had before. So that one can really rehab and do well. I'm not going to talk very much about the posterior cruciate <coughs> on the back of the knee, because that's if you have that level of injury, you're in the wrong centre probably. It's not that common in skiing. Cartilages are torn all the time, not just in skiing, and we'll try and fix them or try and repair them. Um, and this shows one of the things we've discovered fairly recently. The cartilage isn't torn, <coughs> but the back of the cartilage, where it basically glues to the back of the <coughs> that bit gets ripped, and it's really common with an ACL tear. It's called the ramp lesion, and people didn't know about that. And if it wasn't recognised and wasn't treated, there's a really high instance of failure of rebuilding the knee, just fails. That's an ACL reconstruction, and that's that's before, that's when it's been sewn together, so there's no gap. Um, uh, people ask about me you know, about bracing all the time, so that's an ACL type brace. Uh, there definitely are protected, but you can still tear your ACL in it. There's a big psychological benefit. Lots of patients ask to get one for their normal knee, because they're torn one, they don't want to tear the other. Um, there is a big cost involved to be fitted properly. Um, and it's a difficult call really, but people want clarin scheme without doing surgery. They're only doing it one or two weeks a year. It's a good option. What do you do with a knee replacement? Well, the advice actually from the FIS is that you shouldn't scheme. Absolutely shouldn't. So I talked to some of the Swiss surgeons here, locally in fact. I talked to some near where we are, shall is, and they said, uh, you can't say that. If you told them you can't skip after knee replacement, your practice will be dead in about six months. <laughs> so obviously it's locality based rather than necessarily hard <coughs> to science or logic. So in the Swiss population, they said 22% got back to their knee replacement. So interesting. But I think it's how they ski is important. So it'd be nice being yeah, a powder nebula would be nice, shallow gradient, and they can carry on touring, they can carry on lying right as well. But the big risk then is fracture. If you fracture near a new replacement, it gets really difficult. Um, and there's this question about I don't know how many of you see your clients coming with Ski Mojo, making a really big play at the moment. And basically, it's a big spring that compensates the fact you haven't got any quadriceps. So you bounce back up again. So every time you go down, it pushes back up. So you, that time you'll be tired at the end of the day, it'll push you back up. So I think it's really interesting. I ski with people who. who them on. It's really entertaining watching them putting them on in the morning and take them off. It looks like a bondage sort of <laughs> set up, really. Um, but uh, I've got one friend who absolutely swears by it, so it's fantastic. So um, jury's out on that one. Uh, and that's one of my good friends, so you had know, both hips done about five years after both hips been replaced. No problems at all. So hip replacement is fine. And that's it. And in the bottom line, trust your guide get good advice, and be safe on those at all times. Thank you very much. Do you have questions at the end? Yeah. How do you want to do it? Yeah, because I am the bossy person. Um, we can do some questions while... Are you going to... Steve, do you want to jump in? While you're sat in there. <laughs> so if anyone has any questions, please fire away. They have to hold you in because if they don't hold you in, you're also going to get badly hurt. Yeah. yeah. So there's, a, there's a crossover point, really, unfortunately. Yeah.
And the classic story, of course, is the fall. It's usually low velocity yeah. twist. I felt yeah. to snap in my knee. My bindings didn't work. Something that's about a hole in it. I need some as a rest on it. Yeah. Do you want to start with the floor? No, no, no. It's actually quite a bit wide. So you mentioned the importance of din setting and bindings. Yes. So you go to C shop, they punch your stats in and give you a din setting. Is that the right din setting, or is there more to the story? Usually it's pretty good. It's related to weight, and then you're ready to learn what you're planning to ski. So it's normally if you just give, if you always to back weight, if you are honest about your ability and what you want to ski, they will adjust to cool. And that's a good guidance. It's when the people say, I'm a really good skier, they will, they will, they will they'll be forced to just crank it up because you just said, I'm going to ski hard and aggressively. I need to stay in my bindings or I'm going to get hurt. Yeah. So, so if you give them the correct information, most ski shops are visit, so it's certainly in they're really good at doing it properly. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry, Steve. I'm you in. So, uh, well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Steve Corbett. I'm one of the shoulder surgeons at Forties. Um, I am one of the original members as well. I still work at Guys and St. Thomas's NHS. Um, so, why shoulders? Well, you saw Andrew with his knee, and he described me as doing this and a little bit of that. Well, this one does a lot more things. <laughs> <laughs> much more complicated, much more sort of you got to be at the top of your game. <laughs> also, also, I'm the only person who's speaking tonight who isn't injured. So, <laughs> so I will sit down because otherwise you won't see. But, so hopefully. Bear with. So I'm also the only person who's got technical issues. <laughs> There's nothing like this, dude. No, no, no. This is a girl. I wonder if it's slow because it's just changed. Anybody got any ideas? Totally changed. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so obviously here we are in a beautiful resort as opposed to sort of London or uh, north, the north of England um, and I know where I'd much rather be and clearly there's a lot of people in this room who <coughs> prefer to be here too. I'm well aware there's a lot of different expertise in this room, hopefully there's something in the talk for everybody. So as Andrew was saying, you know, Injuries to the shoulder are no different to injuries elsewhere. Um, they are about 10% wall skiing injuries, 15% of snowboarding injuries. They're potentially twice as common in snowboarders compared to skiers. First day participants, over tw tw twice as likely to, occur to have an injury. Last day as well, last run, as we heard earlier from Andrew. Higher incidence in uh, adults than children and use of rented or borrowed equipment. Uh, I'll just borrow your boots or I'll just borrow your skis. <coughs> All adds to your injury risk. The five main risk factors, again, as Andrew was highlighting, inadequate preparation physically, increased in females, high skill level, unfavorable genetic predisposition. So things there may be along the lines as if you've got a bone problem, if you've got potentially hyperlaxity, can make can increase your injury risk, and also your skis. And I'm not an expert on skis. I certainly um, am nowhere to the standard of the other speakers, but I enjoy it. So up at, up here, how do we injure it? Well, direct impact when you fall on it, or when you are bringing your arm out to the side, like so. This is called abduction. If you then load through your arm like this, or when you rotate round a pole, or like so. 
Those are the injury sort of patterns that will affect the shoulder. And what are you going to do? Well, you may break a bone, you may injure a joint, or you may injure the soft tissues in the shoulder. So the bony injuries are going to be around the collarbone, the clavicle, the humerus, the top of the humerus, has got an attachment called the tuberosity. Um, scapular fractures are normally much more high in energy injuries. So shoulder blade fractures, if you've got a shoulder blade fracture, you've really hit something hard. Um, in the joint, we've got several joints around the shoulder. We've obviously got the main ball and socket joint, but we've got a joint at the end of the collarbone, and we've got a joint at the other end of the collarbone. So the acromioclavicular joint out here, the AC joint, I've already found two people in the room who've got AC joint injuries. I've only spoken to four. <laughs> <laughs> and the sternoclavicular joint here, again, it's normally a more um, aggressive injury, shall we say, a greater velocity injury. The soft tissues are things like the tendons, the ropes that are going to lift and move your arm around. They are, they're connecting the muscle to the bone. Or there's a couple of other things which I'll show you in a moment. Or the big muscle groups, your pec, your biceps, your triceps. You can rip any of them. So sites of dislocation. The most common is the ball and the socket. Elbow, less common. The joint on the top of your shoulder, about one in five AC joint injuries. There's a higher fracture dislocation rate in skiers. So not only do you dislocate, say, the ball from the socket, but you also break a bone at the same time. There's a higher incidence of that also if you're doing it more than once, recurrent dislocations. And as we get older, then our injury pattern changes on a dislocation of the ball in the socket. And we become much more likely to tear tendons as well as dislocate. So when you see people who've dislocated their ball and socket joint, then you have to work out, do you need to do an operation for these people? So if somebody's aged 17 to 20 and they dislocate, they're almost certainly going to dislocate again. So you're probably going to offer those people an operation to stop it from happening. If somebody's older, then the chance of it dislocating again is actually much lower. But I stress that that age group of patients you've got the added risk to the tendons. And that's often missed. So the patterns of injury with dislocation vary. So if you think of the ball in a socket like so, the socket is actually quite shallow. So to hold it more, we have like a tire, a ring around it. This is called the labrum. So it holds the ball more like this. So when you dislocate, the ball's going to come out, it will hit the tyre, and it will tear the tyre away from the socket. So that is called the labrum. And often as the ball slides out the socket, it goes bang. So you get a big divot off the back of the ball as it slides through. And sometimes you might even break the socket as well with that impact. So you go bang, bang, and tear. So there's a whole spectrum of injuries that you can have when you dislocate. And therefore it's really important that you work out what the injury pattern is. So here, if you look at these, the easier ones first, this is the ball of the shoulder, and you can see a divot out of it where the balls hit the front of the socket. It's twisted round, come forward and impacted. Here, it's broken off part of the socket of the shoulder. And the soft tissue injury on that MRI scan relates to this structure, which is the ring which we've been <coughs> running around the socket, and it is torn. So this is what it looks like inside. So this is the ball, that's the socket, this is the ring, and this is a tear. Here, not only is it torn, but you've injured the cartilage on the socket. So that's going to increase your risk of arthritis in the future. And here, you've broken the bone off the socket. So the ball's gone out, it's hit here, and torn that, uh, uh, torn that and fractured it. This is what the back of the ball looks like, where it impacts. 
So that's the socket, that's the ball. You can see normal cartilage. This is where that has gone out the front and impacted. And in this case, there's a, there's a fracture here, so the socket isn't in normal shape, and that bit of bone is missing. So when the patient lifts their arm up, that defect hits that defect, and the shoulder just drops out. There's nothing to stop. So there are different ways that we can deal with that. A lot of the surgery we do is keyhole surgery. So we put a camera in and we repair the soft tissues. We repair the ring back onto the socket. Sometimes we do a similar thing to the back of the ball and push tissue into that so you don't have a divot, it's covered over. And then sometimes we do a completely different procedure where we move bone around in the shoulder to compensate for where you've got a bone defect. Okay, so these are a list of all the things that you can do. So this is repairing the ring in the socket. So there's the ball in the socket. This is the ring. So we pass stitches through it. We drill a hole. And then we put the anchor into the bone. So it's like putting a tent peg into the ground with guy ropes and we sew this back on. So that's an arthroscopic repair. We can do it a similar thing as I say to the defects on the ball, but the anchor is the back of the ball with stitches, guy ropes, pass them through tissue and push tissue into this so that it doesn't fall out the front of the shoulder. And the bony injuries, so you've had a break like that and your socket, instead of being like this now, is like that. We take some other bone in the shoulder, we cut it and we move it and we screw it onto the front of the socket. So you end up with the ball in the socket, a couple of screws, <coughs> nice washer from B&Q and just stick that back on. Very straightforward. So when we see people who we think need surgery, our decision making is very much guided by how, well, apart from age and things like that, but how is the defect looking in the shoulder? Is it okay? Is it going to fall out? Does it fall out? And again, if there's a defect of the socket, <coughs> is the ball just going to slide off that? Or is it going to be contained? So these are the sort of thought processes that we have. We have sort of a pathway, which is a clue the operation we should be doing if we're doing surgery. So does surgery work for a dislocation of the ball and socket? Yes, but it's not perfect. So your risk of re-dislocation after keyhole surgery is about 15%. So 85 to 90% of people will not dislocate again. <clears throat> people are generally satisfied with that sort of surgery, but for the physio teams, you often do lose a little bit of external rotation. Do you get people back to doing what they want? If you've had a shoulder stabilization, can you go and ski? Can you go and play rugby? The answer is yes, but again, it's not perfect. If you've had to move bone around in the shoulder, it indicates that it was a bigger injury, so the likelihood of you going to the sport again is going to be a little bit less. And the normal time to return to sport is not what patients want to hear. It does take time, even with professional sports people who are seeing their physios every day, let alone the people who are just seeing their physio once a week. So you're looking at probably six to eight months for most people to get back to play. And if you have dislocated your shoulder, whether you've, dis whether you've had surgery or not, you've got a 10% risk of getting arthritis in the future in that shoulder. Okay, so rehab, if you're not going to operate, these are the sort of rehab pro programs that you can find. You do not need to be in a sling for weeks on end. A sling for a few days is absolutely fine and then you can be mobilising, progressing through to a strengthening programme 
and then further um, input. So who might need surgery? Certainly if anybody's less than 30. Second or more dislocations, if they ski, if they play rugby, football to an extent. If they make movements and they think their shoulder's coming out, then you're probably going to want to do something to help them. They've lost confidence if it feels unstable. And I stress this one about being over 50, that if you've had a dislocation, you probably should have a scan to check the tendons, rather than wait three to six months and then find out that you've torn your tendons. So the joint on the top, the AC joint, is normally that bone would line up like so. So you get swelling and you get deformity and the degree of injury is reflected by which ligaments are injured. You can get little ligaments here at the joint and some big pieces of rope from the bone down here. So if you look at this, in five years in Denver, 340 AC joint injuries, nearly well, about five to 10% of their referrals in their uh, department. More common in men, more common in snow, snowboarders. <coughs> Ladies or women are more likely to have a lower grade injury. Men, uh, um, again, again, relating to snowboarding. So when you dislocate your joint, your <coughs> collarbone, It'll either do that and go back into place, or it might sit half in, half out, they might say out, or it might do this, and you can hang your coat off it, that's quite an interesting one. Occasionally it goes backwards, so there's a spectrum of injury. And the reason we need that spectrum, or refer to that spectrum, is again, it tells you what to do. So in the lower grade injuries, where things are pretty much lined up, you don't need to do surgery. You need some good rehab, but no, it takes time for these injuries to settle. So, a good couple of months for most people. The middle grade injuries, where the <laughs> collarbone is sitting out, they're, quite, well, they're more difficult, because some people do fine, and some people do badly. So you have to try and predict where your patient's going to sit. And one way of doing that is getting the patient to take their arm across their body, and if that doesn't drop back in, they're probably going to need an operation because it's going to stay high riding. And what that does is it changes all the mechanics of the shoulder. So the, the shoulder blade moves into a different position, causes pain at the front of the shoulder, pain often on the inside of the uh, scapula here, and then movements become very uncoordinated. And I can see somebody at the back of the room just checking his shoulders at the moment. <laughs> So we have different treatment ways of, de of dealing with these. So low grade injuries, don't need to operate. 98% of them get better. High grade, you do need to operate. The middle ground, you can wait for a few <coughs> weeks and then make a decision. Is it going back in or is it staying out? And when we repair them, it, it'd be very nice to tell you that it's really <coughs> technical exercise. Basically, we get a piece of rope we wrap it around that bone, we wrap it around the collarbone, we stick a screw in, and then sew it back up. So, you know, it is a piece of rope. And then you've got to be immobilized, you need your physio again, but it returns to sports is normally about three to four months if you have that sort of surgery. Collarbone breaks, much more common, um, especially with hard ice, snow conditions. Snowboarding, terrain parks, often associated with jumps, um, and it's normally a direct impact into the snow. And you can do other things as well. You can <coughs> injure your nerves into your arm, you can injure your blood vessels, injure your lung, and also get scapular and rib fractures. <laughs> what we shouldn't be seeing, any of us, are people with these sorts of problems. Okay, that, that should have been dealt with in, in the hospital. Okay? Most of the time we break in the middle of the collarbone, then to the outer end of the collarbone. More rarely is it the middle bit, or the inside bit, if you want, of the collarbone. And you, you get different patterns of fracture. You can get a little crack, you can get a bit of angulation, you can get these where they've moved around with other fragments, a 
and then you can get just a mass, or a mess, I should say, of bone. So here you can see the bone's broken. There's a big piece here. It's all out of place and it's all shortening down. And what we've learned is if you leave it like that, it will heal sometimes. Sometimes it doesn't. But when it heals short, patients don't like it because it changes the mechanics of their shoulder. So if you get something like that, which was left, a lot of patients are not going to like it because it's sore. When they lie on it, their shoulder doesn't feel right. When they make their movements, they start getting pain elsewhere in their shoulder. So there are a number of indications that we have where we interfere and plate the, these injuries. Now this one here looks quite angulated. But this is a young, young guy, probably about 14, 15. He will still have capacity for those bones to remodel. So it might start off looking like this, but you can see it's starting to heal, and you can see that the angle is getting less. And as people grow, you can grow out that angulation. So you can have horrendous looking angles of collarbones in young people, you know, in kids, adolescents but they remodel. Whereas something like that, that bit should be here, and there's a bit off there, that isn't going to heal satisfactorily, so you play and you screw it. At the outer end, these are slightly more <coughs> difficult breaks, but again, there's a high failure rate that they don't heal. So we often interfere with these, we put plates and screws on. This is called a hook plate. It hooks under this one to stop it bouncing back up. It does need taking out, and sometimes people forget that. And then sometimes if they haven't healed, you have to interfere. You put bone graft into here, you hold it all down, you screw it to this bone as well, and you get your fingers crossed. So rehab there for collarbone breaks, only a couple of weeks in a sling, maybe three to four. Then you start mobilizing, then you start strengthening. It normally takes about three months for a bone to be 90% healed. Certainly six months until it's completely healed. Just to highlight these, this is the ball, this is the socket, this is the edge of the ball, and this is where the tendons come in like so. So this is often like a, a fall onto the, uh, onto the elbow, on the hand, and it pistons up, and that impacts here. So this is easy, this one, because you can see there's a break here, and it's moved, so it probably needs to be fixed. That x-ray there looks normal, but when we do a scan, you can see there is a break here, and this is where the tendons come in, called the rotator cuff tendons. So this injury can cause confusion, because people come back from the slopes with their x-ray, which looks normal, but two months later they're still struggling to lift their arm up, and it's because the tendons won't work properly till that's healed. So if somebody knows within the first week that injury is going to take three months, they're relaxed. If after two months of seeing their physio, the physio is normally getting the blame because it's not got better, when in fact the injury was there all the time. And it's nothing to do with the physio, it's nature which is still taking time to heal. So there again you can see all that whiteness that's bruising in and around the ball. Now I'll just finish with these. If you see somebody with massive bruising around their chest, upper arm, there's a reason for it. So this is quite easy. You can see that this guy's pec is torn. But sometimes these injuries are missed, which is a surprise, because you normally get the deformity, but not every time. So massive bruising around the chest, upper arm, there's something happened. And here's a chap from last year who finished his holiday, and what he'd done is he ripped his triceps off the back of his elbow here, so that should be attached down here. Um, but he enjoyed himself. <laughs> he, told me, he told me that the beers uh, soon made him feel a lot better. The concern was, of course, when he got back, that his occupation actually was a landscape gardener. So we did fix it and he got back actually, 
I said three months, I know he was working after six weeks, but it's his livelihood and sometimes you have to accept that. So there's a lot of injuries that you can have up here. In terms of conditioning, then everything down in the legs, the core here, impacts here. Because if you're not strong here, you're more likely to get an injury, you're more likely to fall. So specific shoulder conditioning is a little bit more difficult to advise. There'll be people in the room who probably have problems with their rotator cuff, inflammation around their shoulders. So exercises to strengthen the cuff can be helpful. But the major way to avoid an injury up here is to make sure that your core and your lower body for skiing is up to scratch. So I'll leave that there. Thanks. Um, thanks guys, that was brilliant. Um, again, welcome everybody to the evening. Um, a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight is um, <coughs> more related to why we kind of cross paths with the Fortius Clinic. Um, we run a, our ski academy obviously here in Berbier. You guys are going to fly here, there's <coughs> got a, a few different explanations about the movement patterns that we, we look at and we assess. And try to bring this screen up just in two seconds. Uh, like that. Okay. It'll sort itself out. It'll sort itself out. Yeah. Well, maybe it won't. Let's have a look. Um, so, <coughs> we, uh, we, we run a, a ski academy, but we, we do a little bit more in the background work where we do a lot of work off of the hill. So, a, a lot of our philosophy about ski coaching. And about how we, there we go, um, how we make uh, solutions for people is definitely a lot spent on the mountain, uh, uh, like a lot of you guys here skiing with us in Berbier. But in the recent years, we've started to look closer at how people can empower themselves to coach themselves and to make solutions for their uh, skiing technique. And one of the things that we've always realized in the marketplace that we work in <coughs> is the relationship between us as the ski coaches. Um, the, uh, the, the the ski shops, you know, where people go to get their equipment, um, and the individual themselves, so the biomechanical movement patterns. Um, we've been doing the Ski Technique Lab as a tour for nearly 10 years around the UK, and one of the things that sort of, uh, it's like alarm bells, um, and, and what these guys do obviously is is rehab, and what we're trying to get to, and the reason we, we have a relationship is, is a prehab. So we want to sort of, help people uh, understand and evolve their movement patterns. Um, you've all got this flyer here, here in front of you. Um, but when you look at this, we, we look at really simple patterns of movement for skiing. So the first one you can see is ankle flex range. Um, when we test people on this range, we, we see that people usually come up short. So most of the stuff that we do when we're doing our talks around the UK, um, we would love in the future, we're not, we're not going to test people tonight, we wouldn't have time to do that, but we would love in the future that people almost um, condition themselves for a ski boot fit. So, you know, some people go to get the ski boot fitted and their, their foot is not physically conditioned uh, to do that. Um, some people can be quite tight in their calf muscles, some people can lack flexibility, but even the muscles around the foot uh, could do with um, some, some education. So that's, that's one area that we see. When we do the, the flex test, we, we often see that people have a, a difference between their left and right uh, range of movement. Okay, so this usually translates straight back into their skiing. And if you got put under pressure, if you're skiing something where you uh, was unpredictable that you hit like a, a cookie in the powder, you know, and, and you slammed it, when we often see these on our, on our talks and our tests that someone has a three or four centimeter difference between left and right, it's usually going to be one side of the, the leg that's going to take the brunt of, a, of an injury. Um, ski asymmetry is it's another thing we, we focus on. As the guys were mentioning earlier, you know, MCL, um, ski asymmetry, I mean, most of the people that we teach in, in an academy week will have an A-frame. And that, you know, that, that really goes without saying. Um, and if people had the chance to sort of learn about the, the muscles in the legs that could stabilize 
the symmetry in the legs, they would actually do a better job than we do as ski coaches on the hill trying to fix someone's A-frame. So if you, if you learn what muscle groups can stabilize your legs, then, then you get a, a big feedback. We do a thing on here called a 10 second test, which is very slowly trying to pull your feet towards each other. And uh, what we found over the years of doing these tests, uh, uh, ski shows and talks, is that people's legs actually shake, you know, when they're trying to do this test. So, so we know that people aren't uh, pre-equipped with a specific range uh, in, in their legs to stabilize that movement pattern. Um, and the third one is probably one of the most important ones, which is leg steering range. And we, we often find that people have a difference between left and right. So I think most of you guys in the room will know that if you're ever gonna traverse onto a face and you've got to put in that first turn, if, it, if it's something that intimidates you, you, you kind of hope that you went in on the side that you favor. Um, but we all know as skiers that everybody has a weaker turn direction. With the leg steering range, we look at the inner rotation of the outside leg. So that could also be translated as the downhill leg of the turn. Um, <coughs> and most of the people that we test when we do this usually show up a 20, 25 uh, degree difference between left and right. So if you can identify that before someone comes out to the slopes, you, you've got a really good chance of trying to improve their skiing technique before they've got there. And uh, we were talking about this the other day, that, that there is so much that can be done off of snow. And, and I think the future where we want to take this is to have a, a closer relationship with the ski shops, with the, with the ski coaches. And you know, this isn't just about our academy, this is about someone that goes and spends 500, 600 quid on a lesson in St. Anton and has a, an instructor saying, finish off your turns. And if the person goes to that lesson with a physical restriction on one side of their, their rotation range, they've lost quite a lot of the investment of what that ski lesson might be. So th there are six, uh, sorry, there's six points altogether. You, you'll see on, you know, definitely take time to have a look through the website on this and we, and we put a little bit of effort into explaining to people what they can do to help improve these movement patterns. But the idea behind this is that to avoid getting into the queue to see these guys, you know, if, if you can unlock a, a lot of the movement patterns, uh, you'll be a better skier. And, and the guys are making the point as well, you know, get better at skiing anyway. Um, improve your technique, you'll have a better time on the mountain. But this is the stuff that we usually can't fix on a five day course. So if you come on a five day course, we, we can't you know, go through stretching regimes that are intense because it's too intense, too quick. It, these things take weeks, sometimes months. Um, but the awareness alone will, will change it. A lot of people that have tried and tested this can do this at home by themselves. It's, it's not rocket science. Uh, we work, you know, with, with Lily and, and, the, and the girls here from Verbia Touch, and there's other physios, and wherever you, you're based, uh, quite often the education of this will make you sort of think twice, and like, actually, why isn't that part of my body moving? Um, and skiing is not rocket science. You know, there's, there's, a, there's a few movement patterns that we have to make, but it's, um, it's really interesting for us, you know, doing these talks and doing these lectures when we go around you know, on our UK tour to see just how many people which I would say is way over 95%, don't actually have the movement patterns in their body to perform the sport of skiing technically correct. Which is a shame, because you could, you know, it would be very easy to sort of uh, highlight that. So that, that's where we're going with the, uh, the Ski Technique Lab. The, the, the future of it is, um, we've got Leo here from Ski Service, uh, <coughs> top boot fitter. We want people in the future to prepare for a ski boot fit, but, but not to walk into a ski shop with um, how do you ski, I'm, I'm, I'm really good, or someone plays themselves down. We want, we want everyone to have a video of how they ski, to know that they can be filmed in the correct way, to go and take it into a ski shop and then get their boot fitted really correctly. Um, because the, the bit that we try to get closer to with this is that the connection between your body and obviously the skis is your ski boot. Um, and it's a really important factor of quite a lot of fundamentals behind this. Um, if, if you want to find out more about this, go on the website, but most of the stuff you can do yourself, you don't need us as coaches to guide you through it, it's, it's pretty self-explanatory. Um, but um, this, is the, this is the philosophy behind how to coach, and this is also one of the reasons that we got uh, to know these guys. Um, and I've, I've busted myself up a few times, so this is the other reason these guys are here. So, I, I didn't really want to say too much tonight. This is kind of a future as to where we're trying to take our coaching to, to make relationships with people that can better benefit people. Um, 
but that's that's it really. That's uh, th these guys were the sort of the, the these were the money for the night for you guys coming tonight. Uh, but that, that's that's it. So we, we're around. If you want to ever ask us questions about it, you can do. Uh, and, and the tests themselves, definitely try and put the time into doing it because you'll probably find that you'll have a very different pattern between your left and right side of the body, and that's the sort of thing we have to turn. We're not in a multi-story car park for skiing. We go left and right. So. Yeah, amazing. Um, and thank you guys for coming over. That's really uh, kind to put on the evening for us as well. Um, by the way, we, we did a talk, probably one of the best talks we did uh, on our tour uh, was with these guys. And I think me and Jamie and Rob were sort of sitting there like gobsmacked at watching the information that we gained from hearing these guys talk. Um, but what was interesting for us, it was a room of physios. Um, and, and interesting for them, they were all quite interested to to get a better education on this. So, so one of the things about the Ski Technique Lab is uh, there is a, an education program, an expert program. Some of the boot fitters in the UK have gone through it um, and put the stiff up on the wall. Physios that we work with uh, working through it and gone through it. And um, that would hopefully be the future that the, the, <coughs> the people, not us, but the people that are dealing with the customers that want to get ski fit or want to get a good boot fit have a better education for this. That's it. So we're good. Yeah. If anyone's got any questions, obviously we'll be around here for a little while, so please feel free to come and chit chat to us. And thanks for coming. Really. Thank you. Okay.